years with our audios uh, and, and, and our, our teaching sessions and all of that, then we really do have a wealth of, of, uh, of programming. It's just getting it in the proper format. But also, it, it will, we will be able to utilize all of our ministries. Uh, and it'll not just you know, be me or having a radio uh, program. Uh, and uh, that's, that's always much better because then it, then it emphasizes uh, and brings into it the whole fellowship. So uh, be much in prayer about that. Uh, we, um, um, <clears throat> it will, uh, you know, it'll take place in the very uh, uh, short Uh, what I'm trying to say, the very soon future, <laughs> uh, in the next week or two. And, uh, and just pray that the Lord will also direct our brother there in Ohio uh, and uh, uh, I'm supposed to meet with him in Virginia in one of the meetings out there at the end of this Month, we've never actually met him face to face, but we have had very much communication with him. So just be much in prayer concerning. It's just it's another outreach, another outreach for this gospel, and uh, we're we're very much thankful for it. Now we've been looking at over the weeks and the months, uh, <clears throat> the, the question, the statement, who is the church? We started out just saying, what is the church? Because that's, what, that's the way it usually is said, but that actually has no answer to it because the church isn't a what or a thing. So we changed that to who is uh, the church, Pardon? We're the church, aren't we? The people of the church. Yes. There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I could. She said we're the we make up the church. I know you do. Yes, yes. But I I I wasn't for sure whether you was asking a question or making a statement, and then I realized it was a statement. Yes. Very true. Uh. Taking that one step deeper in our study, we have found that the church is a who. The church in its full definition is Christ. Is Christ. Uh, we, could, we could say that probably with greater definition by simply saying Christ is the church. Why? Because he... Because if he, if I wrote a statement this morning, the church is distinct from, but not other than Christ. Well, what do you mean by that? I mean that I'm not Christ, and you're not either, and we're not Christ, all put together. But if you take Christ out of me, out of you, out of us, then there is no church. The church is not a religious gathering, primarily or a gathering together of the religious. No. Uh, the church is where two or three are gathered together in the reality of the indwelling person of Christ. And there can be there a gathering of two, or there can be there a gathering of 2,000. It doesn't make any difference because the gathering is really all about the one. If Christ is not there, the church is not there. Just a bunch of people are there. And we've come to realize that, that we become the church, and yes, that is a true statement, we become the church when Christ comes to dwell in us. And, 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 and so, 
you know, we can say we are the body. Yes, we are the body, but we are the body of Christ. Again, when Christ is out of that, there is no body. And the church is defined, as we've seen months ago in our studies, uh, made him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. He being the fullness that filleth all in all. So, uh, it is right that the people, uh, it is right that the believers are the church uh, through our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is true. Someone has said, and probably rightly so, I think it was Brother Sparks that I first read this from, actually as far as a statement goes, and he said, the church is Christ having corporate form. It is Christ in you, and you, and you, and you. Well, what makes us one? Certainly you can't see that in each other. Just look around. As far as background, as far as anything, ethnic background, uh, gender, what makes us one? The one who lives in each of us. The one who lives in each of us. There are a number of souls sitting here. But there is only one spirit. If any man have not the spirit of Christ in him, dwelling in him, he is none of his. Christ is that one spirit. That one life, that one reality. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. But the earthen vessels are deteriorating every day, and yet the church continues. Why? Because Christ himself is the life of it. Members change, the church remains the same. You understand what I'm saying? The church can only be truly defined through our relationship with Christ. There is either that relationship there in the knowing of him, in the abounding and the increase of him because the body of Christ is for nothing less than the increase of Christ. All right, we've been looking at that and then recently I was, uh, we, we, we come through a series then, if, if that is true, then how important it is for us by the Spirit of God to see Christ as he is, Christ revealed in you. And we, we had many sessions on that, Christ revealed in you. The scripture is full of, well, I've, I always quote the one John says in one of his epistles, uh, where is our fellowship? Where is our walk? Where is our walk together? Our fe- where is it? John says, uh, in the first chapter, verse 7, I believe, of, of, of 1 John. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And he goes on there. Do we hear what is said there? Because in another place, in fact, in the third chapter, he says, Be seeing him as he is. For we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As he is. And that's used throughout the New Testament. Seeing him as he is. What is that? Seeing him as he is, is seeing him inwardly, knowing him inwardly, as the Father reveals him to be. Jesus says, and it's recorded in Matthew 11, No man knoweth who the Son is. King James says, no man knoweth the Son. The original is, no man knoweth who the Son is, save the Father. And no man knoweth who the Father is, save the Son, and him to whomsoever he shall reveal him. So there is a revealing by the Holy Spirit. There is a revealing that is necessary for you and I, who are the body of Christ, to know the one whose body we are. 
See, honey, it's not enough to just outwardly say, yes, we're, I'm the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. To know it in that way. Yes, the fact of the matter is, the outward, we're, we're, the, we're the body of Christ. Uh, the revelation given of God is not that you and I are the body of Christ. The revelation given of God is to that body. And the revelation given to that body, worked in that body, is the revealing of the Son himself. So that we know the one whose body we are. Not just know we're his body, but that we know the one whose body we are. And that comes down to having worked in us the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Paul speaks of that, as you well know, in Corinthians, the mind of Christ. That is the Spirit of God working in our soul, the comprehension of the Father concerning the Son, the comprehension of the Son concerning the Father. What, what, what have I just said? The comprehension of the Spirit of God. Amen. Not our understanding of spiritual things, but the understanding of the Spirit working in our soul. Now, th th this is just a framework trying to bring us to what I want to, just in a short period of time, say today. And that is... The thought is bringing everything from the outside to the inside. Bringing everything of the testimony. Because every reality that we have in Christ, every reality that we have in Christ has a testimony, has a type, a shadow, a, a figure, a promise, a prophet, has a testimony in the scripture. Jesus said, these are they which testify of me. And that testimony is alive today because the one of whom these scripture testify is alive today. The scripture here in the New Testament give testimony that he's in you. But you've got to come from the testimony which you can read and then you can discount it or you can believe it and say, Father, I believe this. This is your word, but I don't understand this. And ask that the Lord would bring that that is outside right inside. And there's a way he does that. By the Spirit. But our whole life in Christ and Paul's whole ministry and the whole ministry of the New Testament and the reality that's presented there is bringing everything from the outside to the inside. And how how did god how did god do that we've we've read that before i'm depending on your understanding here we've read that before we've seen it we've talked about it but in ephesians the first chapter there's two verses there two verses in ephesians 1 verse 9 and 10 that 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 uh well that makes that as clear as it's as it you know as it's going to be clear uh states that emphatically uh, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times which is the which is that time right now that that dispensation should just be marked out of there because the Greek word is administration on dispensation you cannot take biblical dispensations beyond the cross because that's where times and places and dispensational testament that's where it ends it ends at the cross and it's got to end there in our heart and in our mind that's something else which is what we're going to be talking about in a minute that has to come from the outside to the inside the cross to you and I and the reality of that cross exemplified, fulfilled, and completed in Christ has to come off of Golgotha, has to come off of two pieces of wood, and it has to come off the pages, the, the, the pages of this book as well. It has to come from there and find reality in my soul. 
So how does the Father make that possible? So that what you and I must come to is the truth of what God has done. Now, we have in the Scripture the truth of what God said and what God did and, and all of that. We've got the truth of the testimony here. And then we've got the truth of the testimony in the New Testament that relates to a new covenant understanding. But what did God say about that new covenant understanding? He had given a covenant written on stones, written in parchments that you could read in whatever, you know, in your own language. The Jews read that. It was written in the Hebrew language. But then he says of the new covenant that it will not be that way. The new covenant for a new creation is something that comes from the outside to the inside. I will write in their hearts a new heart, a new spirit. It is all of that testimony becoming a living reality. In whom does it become a living reality? It becomes a re living reality in the one who fulfills it, Christ himself. And that's what we're reading right here. That in the administration of the fullness of times, in the administration of the Spirit, he might gather together in one all things. And that includes all things of the testimony. It includes all things of the reality of God that are in Christ. That he might gather together in one, all things in Christ. Both which are in heaven, both the earthly, both the heavenly, because it is there that we come from an old heaven, an old earth, which typifies the whole Jewish system, the whole old covenant system, to a new heaven and a new earth. We're not talking about the destruction of this planet. A new heaven and a new earth in Christ Jesus. A new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things passed away. Old heaven, old earth. Old, see, outward concepts of an inward reality pass away. Outward concepts of an inward reality pass away. Behold the new is come. And where is he? He's in you. So how does God, if all of this is gathered up in the person of the Son, in whom, in verse, verse, uh, verse uh, 11 there, in whom we have, been, have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Well, there is that dispensation under the law that said everything about, that, that, that was a testimony of Jesus Christ and what it said was true, but it was all an outward testimony given in outward ways, speaking of an inward reality. Hun, you can spend the rest of your life trying to follow this outwardly and it will only bring you to disappointment. The doing of the law. The keeping of the law. You understand? That was Paul's real problem, of course, with the Jews. And Jew, Paul was raised as a Jew, so he knew all of that. He knew that. He tried to do it. Romans 7 shows him trying to do it. Ending up in frustration and making one cry, O oh, wretched man that I am. And this was a man that was after the law with all of his heart. After thou shalt, thou shalt, thou, with all of his heart. And according to... According to the Pharisaic doctrine and all of that, he was concerning the law perfect. But he hadn't found, he hadn't found the reality that the testimony was about. And he couldn't find it in just the doing of religious things. The keeping of that 
in an outward way. He couldn't do it. He knew it was speak. Finally, he come to understand it is speaking beyond me. It is speaking beyond this. There's something more that this is talking about. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ. He found it in Christ. And you know that tremendous experience and encounter but that just started a whole lifetime of an inward encounter because even that moved from the outward to the inward with Paul who says and who says no more except in one conversation later on with King Agrippa because he was there, you know, on trial for his life concerning the resurrection. And so he was explaining to Agrippa how he came from being a, a Jew in the flesh, having only outward circumcision. And he explained that his circumcision had become inward. Had become inward. And we read that in the scripture. But he, start, he tells Agrippa about that encounter where the light shined and he was knocked off of the horse. Those that were around him didn't hear or see anything. He was blinded by it. You know that. But even that outward experience changed. Paul says in another place, not at the encounter with Christ, which was his, virtually his new birth, virtually his baptism. But in the letter to the Corinthians, God hath shined in our hearts. See? That same light. But not now in an outward way. And hon, I'm ashamed to say that I have encountered believers in my lifetime of preaching this gospel who really are seeking something on that order. Some kind of an aberration to appear, you know, in their bedroom or in the car with them. Or some kind of a light to, you know, Light up the whole room where they're... Now given that that happened, just given that it happened, it's not inward. It's not inward. It wasn't with Paul. But it became inward. He hid himself for three years. And it was during that time God revealed His Son in me. God revealed His Son in me. And then in that letter to the Corinthians, God hath shined in our hearts to give, because you see, it has to be in our hearts, it has to be in our soul, because our soul is the only thing that has capacity for that kind of shining. That can have capacity. Because the soul is not temporal. It is not dirt. It is not my brain. No, no. The soul breathed of God for this very reason. And then Adam transgressed the Lord, yes, but now that soul that is redeemed is redeemed for the very it's redeemed as it was right back to original purpose redeemed right back to original purpose restored if you want to use the word restoration but now be careful and hear what I'm telling you right back to original purpose. It's not going any place, going back to the garden for you and I, going back to be an Adam for you and I. I'm talking about that soul experiencing restoration of purpose. 
redemption of purpose. Because God never changed his purpose. When the soul sinned and all of that came about and continued up until the time of the cross, God never changed his purpose. So at the cross, we face the purpose of God. Salvation of the soul is not so we won't go to hell or so one day we'll go to heaven. Whatever you think about those two things, I mean, fine. But if, that, if, if, if that's your idea of salvation, then, then it's way short of God's purpose. Because the purpose in, in creating the soul in the beginning is not different from or other than redemption because he redeemed that soul for the very purpose for which he created that soul. And that was for the habitation of his son. That Christ, see Christ has always been in the mind and heart of God the perfect thing of his creation. The perfect thing of his creation. Man was a type of that created in, 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 in the perfection of innocence. Yes, we could call it that. But it was all temporal. I'm just talking to you about outside understanding versus inside reality. We're not even starting to suggest that the outside that the outside information is not true. It is true. But it is given that our hearts by that may be turned to the living truth. And it's even written in that way. I mean, the way it is written, the form of it, the order of it, the way it's written. We can sit here, as you well know, all day long together and, and see that as a reality. And it's, it's written that way. It's not just written as Bible stories. It's written in a prophetic character. It's written in a testimony of one to come. I don't care what you're looking at. If you're looking at the first creation, the creation of this earth right out here, it is all set in an order that is always projecting to one to come. And where is that projection in Genesis 1? It is in, honey, it's in the seventh day. It's in the day of God's rest. It's in the great Sabbath, which is not some weekday in the natural sense, in the natural sense, but it is a testimony because the Sabbath is, uh, okay, don't get me into that. It, even in Genesis, it's set aside outside of the creation. The creation ended in six days. The Sabbath is not even described as the other days. And yet, I realize that under the law, you know, the seventh day was the Sabbath day, and it, the, sun went, the sun went down and the sun came up and all of that. I realize that. But the testimony of it always points beyond itself. So if you read the testimony, the testimony itself is so written and so put together and so formed that you would have to see this is speaking of something beyond, something beyond itself. It's just that many try to find that something beyond in another place or in another time or in another, rather than in Christ whose testimony this is. This is not a testimony given of God concerning another place. The testimony given of God concerning His Son, who is, who is the place, <laughs> the dwelling place, the abiding place. If you dwell in me, if you abide in me, all of that is speaking of an inward reality. The center of which and the substance of which is Christ himself. Christ in you. Do you realize that? You must be born from above. But what is the result of that? Christ in you. Christ in you. Hallelujah.
Now, again, I'll set that as a framework because we have been looking at that in the two trees in the garden in the last several weeks. And how that one, and, and, and we were looking at those two trees, uh, one as being Adam, and Adam representing human creation, and one being Christ, and Christ, and that tree representing Christ, and Christ, a new creation. And you see those two things right there in chapter 1. I mean, you see them, and, and, and before you get very far, you see the failure of the Adamic creation, you see the failure of it. You, you, you see that, that the enemy can come right into the midst of it. Come right into the midst of it. And the failure of it is there. And you see, you see the result of it there at least in the garden. Man cast out from the presence of God. That, that presence of which the garden was a testimony. That presence. Adam continued to recognize there was a God, but he feared that God. He had no real relationship with that God except to do outwardly, outward service, I mean, we even, with, we even with the Adamic family in the beginning, with Cain and Abel and Seth, we, we have the beginning of sacrifices, outward type sacrifices. And it goes on. It goes on. It goes right up to the cross. And so do these two trees. And what we've been showing you, or what I've been talking about and setting forth, is the end of one tree. The end of the whole Adamic creation comes at the cross. The end of it. That there may be, and that we may come to, through our salvation, a new creation. But there's a lot, but the testimony... Is, uh, in, that is given in the old is very strong in the new because it's fulfilled. The old functioned around one man. The new is one man. In the old, one man named everything that was named. In the new, in the new, everything bears his name. No, that doesn't make... And see, don't go off on silly thoughts and silly things. So many do. We don't start calling each other Jesus. We don't start calling each other Christ. We bear his name in identification. That's The body has identification with the head. The body of Christ does not bear my name. It bears his name. And why doesn't it bear my name? Because at the cross, that creation came to an end. Now these things are done. And the cross was real. When Christ died, all men died with him. And except Christ live in you, you're still as dead as a doornail separated from God and having no life of God in you. I don't care if God is your creator. He has to be the father of your soul. He has to be the life of your soul. Do we understand that? If he truly is your creator, then it's a new creation. In Philippians, you are his workmanship, Paul is speaking. You are God's workmanship. Oh, yes, Created in Christ Jesus. A new creation all together. A new creation all together. And that's the way it is. Every place except in our minds 
And that's, that's where Paul, that's where Paul's preaching comes in. Declaring a reality of Christ that is in you that your natural mind can't understand because your natural mind keeps trying to relate that spiritual reality to outward things. And there is a relation to it. There is a relation of it to outward things, but only in the outward things are a testimony. And that's the only relation to it that there is. But when the real comes, the outward is by the coming of the true done away. The lambs that were slain and bled out at one time, that was honored of God. But the Lamb of God has come. He has died. He has risen again. He lives in you. And God now does not appreciate nor anywhere near except somebody killing an animal out here as a sacrifice. And yet the animals still are there. They still abound. What is written concerning them in this book as a testimony is still there. But the point is, it is now testifying not of that lamb that was an animal. It is testifying of that lamb that in fact not was to be, but that in fact is the Son of God who dwells in you. Everything is brought to its reality in Christ. And while that doesn't eradicate the testimony, it fulfills it. And now we're looking at the testimony not as something talking about something that is yet to come, yet to come, as it was when it was written. But speaking concerning the one who is come and is in you. So as usual, we've got, I, I found, I think we have 15 minutes left and I haven't got my frame painted yet. We've been looking at the tree. I put diagrams up here of trees. The trees are used of Jesus particularly, but remember who he was talking to. He was talking to the Jews. Does that make what he said untrue? No, it makes it a parable. It makes it exactly what he said it was. A parable. So they could hear by parables. Because they had no understanding, nor did they want any understanding of the inward word. And so at least I am today, and then we'll get into this again next Sunday, I'm going to tell you that we have to come from the parables to the inward reality in Christ. We can't continue to look at the tree of life in the figure and shape and form of one of these trees out here on our property. Because the tree of life is the person of Christ himself. You understand? We can't continue to look at the seed of God as something like we sow when we want to get wheat or oats or what not. Though that was used as a testimony, it falls far short of the reality. The seed of God is not some little piece of God dwelling in you. The seed of God that is in you is the full-blown, resurrected, ascended, and now come again in you, glorified Son of God. The seed of God is Christ in you. So we've got to come from our picture of a seed. Though the reality of what this little seed out here given is a type of, the reality of that is completely fulfilled in Christ. 
while that seed if planted as an apple seed will under certain circumstances and conditions and so forth bring about one day an apple. We're talking about Christ bringing forth in my soul, in your soul, the very completeness, fullness of himself. Because it is all there in the seed. It is all there in Christ. How then is it to fill my soul? How then, how does it possess my heart, my soul? In spirit and in truth. Very technically, honey, you listen to me carefully. It is not my soul getting more of his fullness. It is more of his fullness being revealed in my soul. Seeing the truth. Seeing Christ as he is. That's what transforms the soul. That's what renews the inner man. That word renewal is a good word. We'll get to it. But it's a misunderstood word. It's a misunderstood word. Most today are still preaching. Even if they're preaching anything close to this, they're preaching that, yes, we've got to, we've got to get more of his fullness and get more of his fullness and get more of his fullness. Can I just say just a little colloquial simple little term, the whole point is that his fullness must possess more of you. The fullness is there. He is there full. He is not some little baby seed that needs you to nurture and take care of him. He is the full-blown, glorified son of the eternal father. Ha <laughs> ha. If there's any child in this, it's me, not him. You understand that? We have to, hon. You and I, and those who would know him in his body, must come from the outside to the inward reality. And we must quit looking to the outside as an excuse. Well, all I need to do, brother, is get rid of this thing and get away from that thing and quit doing this and start doing this. That isn't going to work. The answer, God's answer, is already in you. If our hearts would turn to see Him, I'm, and this is now, now we're where I wanted to go with this. Because, why? Because I was going to talk to you about the fruit of of the tree of life. We've come to that. We've, we have at least in our teaching. Abolished this one tree. There's no hope of it bearing fruit. Just cut down at the. Cut down at the root. Piled up and burned. That's the work of the cross. But that's a work corporately. That's a work that brought all Humanity into it, the whole Adamic creation into its end. How is it with your soul? Because sooner or later this has got to come into my soul. The whole truth of it. The whole happening of it has got to cease being the old Adamic creation. Sooner or later, hon, it's got to be me. I can't claim the life without claiming the death. Not in a generic way, not in a universal way, no. Same place I claim the life 
in me. Now see, we're ready to start before I left off in my study last night. My, my. It's got to come in, hon. Service has got to be understood as the worship of our soul The worship of our soul, it's got to be understood because the words both mean the same thing. Worship and service, I can show you that. I don't mind just doing the worship outwardly. I mean saying thank you Lord Jesus, praise God and singing our songs. Why, why shouldn't we? But darling, if that's not coming out of an inward reality, then it is just an outward form. And you can change that outward form and make it this and make it that. Take it all away and say, well, it's not going to sing anymore, period. Or you can do whatever you want to do with it. If it wasn't a reflection or more than a reflection, an actual expression of an inward reality, well, you probably shouldn't have been doing it anyway. But getting rid of it is not the answer. Coming to the inward reality is the answer. Coming from the outward to the inward. Where life becomes with me a worship service, rather a service of worship. My soul worshiping the Father through. It's always that way. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through. See? Always coming to the Father through the knowledge of the Son. Through the revealing of the Son. Through the truth that the Son is. Always coming that way. And I tell you, hon, if that inward thing becomes a true reality... It will dominate, it will govern everything that you do outwardly. Or at least not so much, let me say, determine what you do, such as drive a car or drive a truck or fly a plane. But it will always govern the manner in which, in which you do whatever you do. We, we're always trying it the wrong way about. The Jews did that. I agree with one brother that has written, because he's written many things, and he, and, and he, and he has seen Christ. And that's, that's our brother, who is who is dead now as to physical living, or the T. Austin Sparks. But in some area of his before he died, he, he made mention that the religious church world, the religious Christian world now, is almost an exact replica of the Judaism of the day of the Lord Jesus on this earth. It has made its whole foundation in the outward observances. Different things, different, different, different things. I mean, you go to the, you know, you go to, and that don't get upset with me, anybody, wherever you're listening to this in whatever country. Uh, but I got to say, you can go to a Methodist church and the outward observances is one thing. You go to a Lutheran, it's another thing. You go to a Baptist, it's another thing. You go to a Pentecostal, it's another thing. But it's still all outward observances. Now, can you not have outward observances, outward observances, that you are doing observances, Outwardly, you're observing this, you're observing that, you're, you know. Can you not do that from an inward reality? You can, but the question is, are you? 
those things in and of themselves are all outward and fall short of Christ, fall short of worship, fall short of fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is what I want to talk with you about. What is that? What is that? Well, we're on our way to looking at that. We're, we're to our, our third diagram, which is just Christ the seed. First fruits and the whole harvest. Fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. Blessed be the Lamb of God. Fruitfulness is out of the seed. All right. But it's got to come from that outward, hon. Now you can't do that by getting rid of the outward, and so many think you can. They actually think that you can. The, uh, what am I trying to say? The name just got away from me. Luther's time, Luther's time. Uh, pardon? Reformation. Thank you. The Reformation probably started out as something of an inward reality. But that didn't continue. That didn't develop into a real revealing of the indwelling person of Christ. I know it didn't. I, I read the books. But it had to start out that way, particularly in the heart of men like Luther. But you know what it became? It became just getting rid of the outward observances. Getting rid of the Pope. Getting rid of the, basically, all that the Catholic Church only to adopt its own outward formats, outward formations that over the years became traditional foundation. This is what you do if you are a... And notice how that is. This is what you do if you're a Baptist. This is what you do if you're a Pentecostal. This is what you do if you're a Lutheran. What about what you do if you're a son of God? What about this is what you do if Christ is your life? There's nothing wrong with saying what you do unless you're trying to do something in order that Christ be your life. My point is, honey, the whole thing has just got, you know, very little left of the testimony of Jesus Christ and any reality of relationship with Him at all. It's all based upon doing or not doing and the way we do it or don't do it. It all needs to be when you look around, it's just that everything, you just, you just see Jesus. Well, I'm sitting here looking around and in that way, I don't see Him. And in another way, I do. But I do because I know He's in you. He do, I do because I'm not looking at you to try to find him. But most do. Most do. They, you know, they want to find the situation, a spiritual situation, and then they start looking for Jesus in it. The only place you're going to find a true spiritual situation is in Him from the beginning. You're not going to find it in a building anywhere. You're going to have to find it in Him. And take it with you wherever you go. But for God's sake, don't look at it. Don't look for it in the places where you go, the places where you find yourself. Find it in Him and in wherever you are. Express it. Live it. Be faithful to it. This whole thing, hon, of our salvation, of fruitfulness, has got to come from outside to inside. It will not work the other way around. It won't do it. Now, my chief critics right now, across the country and probably around the world, 
say that with, with Brother Lumen, with this guy, it's just all inward, all inward, all inward, nothing outward. Well, so you're not listening to me. I'm telling you it cannot come from the outward. It is not found in the outward. If it's not an inward reality controlling, governing your very heart and soul, then there's nothing of Christ about it. That's what I'm telling you. No, no. I can hear it now. You want me to sit here and describe ten outward things that will result? Well, I can't do that. Because there's probably more like ten billion or ten trillion. And when it comes right down to it, what difference does it make? We always want to, you know, do this and say, look, that's Jesus. How about just living daily in the faith of the Son of God and doing that without fanfare, doing that without pointing to it, doing that without making it some kind of a righteous act. How about doing that? I'm not telling you it. the reality of Christ within does not affect outward things. I'm trying to tell you that it's not the other way around. And we want to look at that. What really is taking place? Now, I'm not going to mess up that board. What, what really is taking place? in our soul when Christ is revealed that is necessary to fruitfulness. So that's what we'll look at. And it's all about this. <laughs> Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. If it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. But hon, that has been so horribly misapplied. May the Lord help us to see it as it is in Christ himself. So that's the end for this morning. Uh, our time is gone. Thank you for being with us. Uh, of course, those that are here are with us. Uh, but you that are uh, with us live via internet this morning. And wherever it is that we may be gathered together with you, may the riches and the blessings of the Lord be yours there in that place. Uh, if we can help you in any way, uh, if we can be of ministry to you in any way, please do not hesitate to let us know. So, the Lord bless you. Look forward to seeing you. Remember, we have, we have some kind of teaching sessions available to you here. Well... At our website, CMI 24-7, there's teaching going on around the clock. There's live sessions going on here almost every day. Go to the website. They're listed there. We invite you to be with us at any time. Amen. The Lord bless. All right, guys, that's it.